All right. So Holland, one of my favorite questions over the last three seasons is the one that you came up with when you said, what's a metaphor to describe dot, dot, dot. Yet this is the question that often trips up our guests. And according to researchers Lakoff and Johnson, metaphors allow us to understand abstract thoughts and feelings that cannot be directly seen, heard, touched, smelled, or tasted. Stated differently, we may speak metaphorically because we think metaphorically. We may. I actually got that question from Malcolm Gladwell. I was uh, reading some of his ideas about uh, journalism and about asking questions when we were first starting to put together the podcast, whatever that's been almost four years ago. Um, but that question has helped us and um, listeners of the episodes take abstract concepts and better understand them. Plus, it wasn't a question that anyone could just Google and get the answer to. But there's so much more to words and how we use them than metaphors. When we did our episode on code switching, you remember, we learned about cultural and regional phrases that help describe ideas. Yeah, that was a great episode. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. And tonight we have extraordinary experts with us to talk about the wonder of words, and how we communicate. Hi, I'm Holland Webb. Hi, I'm Amy Bolin. And you're listening to The Afterword, a conversation about the future of words. First with us tonight is Grant Barrett and Martha Barnett. These are the co-hosts of Way With Words, and we just found out that they are going to be part of public broadcasting here in South Carolina starting October 2nd. But this radio show has been around since 1998, and it has educated, entertained, and entertained listeners, including me. Welcome. Hey, Hello. thanks for having us. Yeah, glad to be here. We are also glad to have Brian Cleary. His repertoire of award-winning word-focused books includes Skin Like Milk, Hair of Silk, What Are Similes and Metaphors. So welcome, Brian. Thanks so much. So all of you have personal stories that set you up to be the people you are and to talk about the things that you do. In 60 seconds each, would you mind sharing the Cliff Notes version of your life and who you are We'll start with Martha and then go through uh, Grant and Brian. Would you bring us a uh, conclusion? Sounds good. Oh, boy. Okay, 60 seconds. I'm going to set my timer here, y'all. Uh, so you might be able to hear in my voice that I am from Kentucky originally, grew up in Louisville. Uh, both of my parents uh, were educators, and so I did a lot of reading as a kid. I had Latin in high school. I had Greek in college, but I nearly flunked the class. And uh, the way I got around that was I found a retired professor of classical languages from Latvia who was a polyglot. He spoke about 24 languages, and he started tutoring me in ancient ancient Greek. And what happened was there were all these connections uh, between and among words that are all part of this great Indo-European uh, uh, language family. And so every single word set him off. We might spend an hour on just a couple of lines of Greek because he would say, well, it's like this in English, and that's related to this word in Hindi, and that's related to this word in Russian. And uh, so I took lots and lots of Greek um, when I went back to college that, uh, that next semester and I ended up uh, studying a ton of Greek. Oops. That's all I have. I, <laughs> <laughs> one minute and six seconds. <laughs> Do you want to hear some more? Absolutely. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> our, our 60 second is very squishy. Okay. All right. All right. Well, in that, in that case, um, you know, we, Grant and I are radio people, so we can stop when we have to, but uh, since this is a podcast, uh, we have a little bit more room. So that's great. So uh, let's see, we got me through almost flunking my ancient Greek class and then going back and taking a whole lot of ancient Greek because I fell in love with it and fell in love with all these connections uh, between and among languages. So I took lots of Greek, uh, graduated from college became uh, a newspaper reporter and I worked because what are you going to do with ancient Greek, right? So I became a newspaper reporter, worked at the Washington Post. I was a medical writer at the Louisville Times uh, back in Kentucky, uh, where the Greek and Latin came in really handy when I was talking with doctors. Um, and that led to a book uh, that I wrote with the family of the world's longest surviving recipient of a permanent artificial heart. Um, but I kept coming back to Greek 
Greek. I kept feeling like I had unfinished business so with ancient Greek. So uh, I went to grad school in ancient Greek. And that was also kind of lonely because who are you going to talk to in ancient Greek? You know, unless you can find somebody <laughs> who's 2000 years old, you know, you're not going to have uh, a lot of interesting conversations, um, you know, over the dinner table. So uh, I picked up Spanish as well, just so I could talk to people. Um, I started freelancing to support my etymological habit and uh, wrote for magazines like for Condé Nast and freelance for the New York Times and other publications like that. And I started writing reader-friendly books on word origins because I wanted to do what my tutor did for me and show all these linguistic connections. And so I was writing books on word origins with a terrible public speaking phobia uh, in my home in Louisville, Kentucky, when uh, Away With Words came calling because there were two previous co-hosts and one of them left and they were searching for another one. And so they reached out to me and despite my public speaking phobia, I thought, my gosh, if I can talk about my passion with lots of people every week, um, then um, maybe I can do this. And uh, so I joined the show uh, in 2004. We're now totally listening now mainly listener supported uh, public radio. I get to use my Greek every single day and I learn from listeners and I learn a ton from my very talented and uh, very smart co-host Grant Barrett. Ooh, that was a nice segue. <laughs> <laughs> when, when you, every time that you, I hear you say your etymological habit, I'm just thinking about doing dodgy deals in an alley. <laughs> oh, I'm mainlining those dictionaries. <laughs> the, okay. like these crumbly papyrus that you're buying with, you know, old coins or something. <laughs> right. Well, for, for all of our listeners who have no idea what etymologi etymological, I can even say it, um, is, we are going to define that word in just a little, little bit. So hang on. Hot dog. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my my story is uh, to to be brief. <clears throat> um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, I grew up in in Missouri. Um, through was a Missouri boy through and through, and my interest in languages was, was uh, piqued early by the books of J.R.R. Tolkien and his love of languages, and by listening to shortwave radio, which I figured out how to do on my own when I was a kid. So listening to all these world languages bouncing off the ionosphere, and so when I got to college at the University of Missouri, and I realized that I wanted to be a better writer because I was starting a, the journalism program there. I intended to start the journalism program there. I I found a, a group called the American Dialect Society, and I joined them because I figured what better way to improve my language than joining people who study language. But it's turned out to be a complete complete false path because uh, <laughs> there's if you want to overthink something, join the linguists because they really, <laughs> they really overthink it. And But it turned out to be a really good thing because this was linguists and lexicographers. This is the actual people, the very ones at the forefront of the field studying the way people actually talk today. And um, I just basically read their journal articles and, and listened to their, their talks and read their emails on their very active email list and uh, over time became very involved in society until eventually I was uh, appointed one of the officers and I'm still 25, uh, I've been an officer for 25 something years now. And then through that society was able to... Um, find my way to jobs as a dictionary editor, specializing in slang and new words. And of course, I had other jobs at the same time. You know, I used to be a journalist and I uh, worked in information technology and I did other things like that. I took a French degree at Columbia along the way, but always the language thing came back to me. And unlike Martha, uh, I had a, a little bit of a language reputation when Away With Words came calling and I was a fill-in host at first and then hired later as the permanent co-host host. And then in 2007, our, uh, we had originally, was, we were a production of KPBS, the public radio station here in San Diego, which is a great station. But at the time, they were having a, a funding crisis. So they had to let a couple of shows and a couple of, a, a bunch of staff go. And our shows was one of them. And so we're like, well, what if we take it over? And they're like, okay. And so we took it over. And so now we run the show with our producer, Stephanie Levine, as a independent nonprofit. We're not a part of any station or NPR. And it's kind of unusual to have this big national show run as an independent, uh, you know, coast to coast um, and heard by podcast around the world. Wow. Holland, we have something to aspire to. 
We have a lot to aspire to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll tell you what, though, what was interesting to me is, Martha, you started out with, I was born in Kentucky, and so was I. And then Grant started with, I was born in Missouri, and we moved to Missouri from Kentucky. So I'm sitting here thinking, I wonder where they're actually from in the state. I wonder if I live near there. Oh, wow. Yeah. You were born in I Kentucky as well, there. Brian? Yes, but I didn't live anywhere near Louisville. So, But uh, you say it right, so that's good. <laughs> I, I heard you say before we started recording that you were in Springfield and I never lived there, but I visited there and I have family near there. And it's a it's a kind of a weird little part of the state, Springfield. <laughs> it's a it's it's I lived mostly in the southeast and the northeast and the eastern side of the state. OK, yeah. sure, sure. Brian, we're, we're like the Cliff Notes version of, on you. Sounds good. You can time me. Okay. <laughs> um, and by the way, one of my one of my eight siblings went to uh, school in Louisville. So we oh. knew how to pronounce it, even in Cleveland. Yes. Oh, excellent. Yes. Uh, American humorist and poet Brian P. Cleary was born in Lakewood, Ohio, the third oldest of nine children. He grew up in one of the five largest creative divisions in the world, where he has put words in the mouths of Dolly Parton, William Shatner, Kevin Nealon, Michael Bolton, and Smokey Robinson. His What I've Learned pieces have appeared in Esquire magazine, and his dozens of books of poetry and grammar have sold more than 3 million copies. He's visited 500 elementary schools in 42 states. He has wow. witnessed, he's witnessed one of baseball's perfect games, given the Heimlich maneuver four times, and has never had a cup of coffee in his life. He knows way more about Bruce Springsteen and men's dress shoes than the average person. Occasionally, he just lists random things about himself with no narrative context. <laughs> okay. Holly, <laughs> this is going to be a wild ride tonight because, you know, we're talking about the wonder of words and I'm already, my jaw's already dropping. <laughs> <laughs> Brian, well done. Well done. Thank you. you. Oh my goodness! Um, yeah, we, we we probably could do spinoff episodes on half of the lists you just read. Mm. <laughs> yeah, that was a great list, and I think we should point out um, that this is a great opportunity to talk about the word illism. I l l e i s m. Oh, do tell. Yes, Illa back it in. Well, illaism comes from the Latin word that means either he or that, and it refers to uh, the action of talking about oneself in the third person. Ah, gotcha. Okay, very cool. Wow. So nice. I'm learning. Illaistic uh, bio there. Very It impressive. was an Ill Ill Illaistic bio. Very yes, I done grabbed it from one of my books and just sort of filled it in from there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, that's just... I knew I could keep it under uh, around 60 seconds if I did that. And by the way, my, I can if I open the shades to my house here, I can see the house of my Greek and Latin teacher from St. Ignatius High School about oh, wow. 50 yards there. Can yeah. you reach it with eggs and tomatoes? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> he was a good egg. Oh, okay. <laughs> he, was a good uh, egg. Yeah. he had a lot to put go. up with me. So, yeah. There we <laughs> Maybe go. Maybe TP. Yes. There right. we go. Well, let's talk about some words and phrases because we, we have you here on the afterword because you're the experts. But, you know, sometimes like myself, I'll speak for me. I am not the expert when it comes to linguistics and the things that we're talking about tonight. So we'd like to level the playing field for folks just a little bit. And we're going to do a rapid fire round, just a few um, quick definitions of some of these words so that we all can all of our listeners can feel like we're, we're um, able to communicate clearly. So the first word or phrase is figurative language. What is that? Anybody? Okay. Um, I'll just throw out that when I am in classrooms with kids, we talk about the, the opposite of something real, like the car coughed in the driveway or the bus wheezed to a stop or the water fountain, um, uh, belched or something like that. You know what I mean? Like, I know that those are personification, but I mean, in other words, they're not actually happening. They're the opposite of something that is concrete and real. That's a way of saying it to a nine-year-old anyway, but go ahead. Off, a loss. That's great. Anybody else? No, that works. Yeah, that's mm -hmm. great. I, I would say that figurative language is where something stands for something else in a way that would be difficult to comprehend if you didn't know a lot about the culture or the language already. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yes. And if they were, if, if a nine year old knew the word literal, it'd be one way of, you know, like being able to show the the split between that. Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. All right. So we talked about this one, Martha, you've already teed this one up for us a little bit. Etymology. What is that? Well, etymology is looking at the history of words and where they came from. It actually goes back uh, to the Greek word etymos, which means true or real or actual. So you're you're actually <laughs> you're actually going back and finding the origins of, of this or that word. And uh, etymologists have different ways of doing this um, by looking, for example, at sound correspondences. You know, you have in Latin the word pater, which means father. And it's etymologically related to the word father in English and fater in uh, German, padre in Spanish, and on and on like that. And they can piece together often uh, the connections between words that you might not ordinarily um, discern. But if you know those patterns of sound changes over time as different languages branched off from that that root and evolved, um, you can follow along there. Um, and more and more, it, it's exciting to uh, look up words um, and find their origins, um, say, an eponym like boycott, which is uh, a, an eponym being a word that uh, comes from the name of somebody else. Uh, some There was somebody actually named boycott who I think was boycotted. I don't remember this story exactly, but there was some <laughs> kind of strike um, that somebody named boycott was involved with. Or, or the word silhouette goes back to a, uh, a, a French uh, cabinet official, I think, who got fired after eight months on the job. Job, and uh, he had a fondness for uh, those uh, kinds of, uh, of renderings of people that, that look like a shadow. And uh, fascinating so for him. How about that? So how is that different than, than linguistics? Well, etymology is one of, uh, I wouldn't even say it's a subfield of linguistics. Etymology is a part of several different subfields of linguistics. Linguistics is the overarching, it's the umbrella term for the study of language and and all the different facets of language, including the, the structure, the sound, the meaning. So we're talking syntax, semantics, phonetics, morphology. And this can include things like computational linguistics. It can include um, historical linguistics, applied linguistics, um, a lot of sociolinguistics, a lot of different field pragmatics. Uh, all these different fields. So linguistics is a really big term. So when somebody says they study linguistics, there's a really good chance that they specialize. And so etymology mm. fits into historical linguistics. And even some people will throw lexicography in there too, which is the uh, the making, the compiling of dictionaries, although others won't. But um, lexicology and historical linguistics would include lexi- or include etymology. Oh, excellent. Okay, so hopefully our listeners have kind of caught up a little bit. Let's talk a little bit about this word dialect. And you all both, you all re- referred to this a little bit in your um, 60 second, who are you? What do we know? What do we mean by dialect? Well, um, some people prefer to say variety rather than dialect because dialect sometimes will have a little bit of a, a stink on it, so to speak. <laughs> um, but a dialect is a variety of a language that is generally mutually intelligible with the standard variety of that language. So, for example, Southern American English has about four or five varieties that are mutually intelligible with mainstream American English. But you can also have, uh, you know, Singapore English, you can have Indian English and Australian English, and all of these are varieties of English or dialects of English, generally mutually comprehensible, but they'll all have their own little things that vary. Perhaps some syntax rules are a little different. Obviously, the the lexicon will differ and uh, some of the, the phonetics will differ, but uh, generally the basics will be the same. Okay. Does it go beyond? Does it go beyond um, pronunciation? Oh yeah, definitely. It's uh, all colloquialisms it, and idioms and that everything. Sort of thing. Everything okay. can be different, but gotcha. but but once it starts being completely different, then it can usually be said to be a different language. Of course, there's sure. a huge debate about what makes a a dialect a language, and you probably all know the 
the old saying about um, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. <laughs> right. So sometimes deciding something as a language is simply a matter of politics. Like the difference between Hindi and Urdu is a political one more than it is a linguistic one. Okay. All right. Well, Brian, you stepped into colloquialisms. What is it? You just you just mentioned it. What do you think? So what people say in a way that is, is a form of communication that seems to be sometimes endemic to either you know, it could be a religion or a region or something like that, but it's the literally the way that they speak with each other, right? Okay. I mean, to as a starting point, anyway. Yeah. Anybody else have anything to add? There, there's a, a kind of registered difference about a colloquialism. Would you say? Um, mm, yes. Uh, colloquialism might be the kind of thing that you might, the kind of language that you use with your friends or kids or in an informal email or informal letter, informal conversation, and maybe not the kind of thing that you would use in a formal conversation, say, with a judge or a police officer or um, a head of state, that sort of thing. Okay. So, so the same person, regardless of their region, their religion, their affiliation with a fraternity or whatever would make them an insider to it or something, could um, in the same day have several different of these and be authentic and not be disingenuous at, at any point. Is that right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And and it's important. Yeah, you've got a great word there, disingenuous. Certainly, your use of colloquialisms um, can be seen as fake if you're borrowing language that isn't yours. And there's mm -hmm. a, a lot of debate about what makes an authentic user of some slang, for example. Um, right. Are you truly an insider or an outsider? Are you faking it? And right. colloquialism and slang are often, they have a great overlap, but they're not the same thing. Yeah. Right. Perfect. Okay. Last, last one, because you all actually, I know because I listen, you have a, a segment on your radio show that does a little wordplay. What is wordplay? What is wordplay? Well, that covers, <clears throat> that covers all kinds of things, doesn't it? It covers uh, puns and gibberish and anagrams. Um, we all play with language all the time. I mean, I mean, you, you might think you don't, but um, do you have cats or dogs? Um, how many names do those animals really have? You know, we, we tend to give uh, a, a cat or a dog one name, but, but boy, by, by the time they're five or six years old, um, they've got a whole string of names <laughs> attached to them, right? Yeah, yeah. Some that you can't say on the radio? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, probably not. And maybe depending <laughs> on, uh, on what they have brought to your house. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, well, I mean, yeah, and we play with words um, that like, for example, names of foods, you know, there's that Cuban dish, ropa vieja, which means uh, old clothes. I mean, I mean, that's just a, a goofy term, right, for a, mm -hmm. for a food. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it is very delicious. All right, well, thank you all so much. This has really helped us out, and we'll now be able to kind of uh, have a, a universal conversation with a little bit of more understanding. Thank you so much. Within one language, we talked about all these different ways that we can communicate while speaking the same language. So what are some of the benefits of having multiple um, meanings for words or multiple ways to communicate in a single language? And what are some of the drawbacks? I alluded to it before when we were talking about dialect and when we were talking about colloquialism, but a lot of languages, English less than some others, but a lot of languages, the way that they're tied into their culture is a way is by allowing you to show levels of respect because other cultures have more important hierarchies. Um, we have it too, uh, but think about the vous form, for example, in French, uh, and and Spanish has the 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 two form is informal, and of course there's a, the vos form. Um, but we don't really do that much in English anymore. But we still have different ways of talking. Where, let's see, if I were to say the word but, that's kind of informal, right? But derriere is a little more formal, right? Mm -hmm. And I might use the word derriere if I were saying to the judge, yes, officer, she hit me on my derriere. <laughs> I might not say but. <laughs> uh, uh, um, 
so there's different ways that so having these words this is called polysemy by the way p-o-l-y-s-e-m-y words having more than one meaning um and having more than one word uh for their thing allows us also to show allegiance to a group so some of it's jargon. So Martha and I have radio jargon. We use it uh, to get our job done. It's kind of a shorthand. But uh, those of us from Missouri might actually have Missouri jargon. We show that we're uh, Missourians and we kind of just know that Missourians use this particular language. And those of us, uh, those of you from Kentucky, you have your Kentucky language. What high school are you from? That kind of sort of thing, right? Um, you know, the, uh, people who say Louisville or locals. So all of this stuff, all of these different clues um, including your word choice when you have more than one choice, give signals to culture, give signals to place, give signals to re- give signals to respect. And these are all the things for by the way, that aren't really included in dictionaries. These pragmatic indicators, these little flags don't show up in thesauruses either. And it's one of the things that uh, are kind of missing when you learn a, a language from books or from tapes or from apps that you can only get by person to person speaking. That's very interesting because I earlier this afternoon was working with a man who is from Kentucky, come to think of it. And he owns 28 businesses across four states. He's working on a book that I'm helping him with. And when I started, I, we had never talked to one another before. And when I first started with, well, what, what kind of tone do you like to take when you're communicating with people? His first words were, I have an Appalachian accent. And I bet we spent the next five minutes with him telling me how he, him sort of driving down his career and his abilities because of that accent. And I'm sitting here thinking, OK, my English grammar and my accent is less pronounced than yours, but I don't own one business across any state. And, you know, you've got me 28 times here, but he perceived himself as being a, an inferior voice because he had that particular accent, even though he had far more to say than many of the rest of us. Mm -hmm. How many times have we heard that story, Martha? Or something like it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. The Appalachian uh, accent in particular is is one of the last things, it seems like, that it's that uh, people can feel like they can make fun of without uh, without really... um, Without repercussions. They can just kind of get away with it. Yeah, that was the word. There's a, uh, you know, Kentucky... <clears throat> you know, Kentucky's poet laureate, Crystal Wilkinson, just uh, published a, a wonderful memoir uh, that we'll be talking about on the show at some point called Perfect Black. And she's from the Afrolachian uh, School of Writers in eastern Kentucky. And uh, and it's about her experience growing up uh, as a black girl uh, in the country. And she has a wonderful essay in that, uh, in that uh, memoir about just how going off to school, she really really felt like she had to squeeze the accent out of herself, you know, to, to just, to just make herself sound different because, you know, people, people would just ask her to perform, for example, you know, talk about what's this and what's that, you know, just, just to make her pronounce those words so they can make fun of her. I mean, it's, it's a, it's really a shame. Yeah, that's a tough one. Brian, did you have anything else to add to um, how maybe, um, having multiple ways to communicate is positive or negative? Well, I think that there are some things that are like metaphorical that I think are just, they're quicker, easier, and they actually, to me, make more sense. Like if we're talking about some business opportunity and I say, you know, what, we need to get our bread in that gravy, you know? Now, I don't really say that, but I got that from a Paul Newman movie and it sounded really cool coming out of Paul Newman's mouth, you know? <laughs> but like give our bread in that gravy, you know what that means. It means that you get, you know, like you're going to take advantage of that or something like that. You know, um, Satchel Paige was writing about love affairs and, and having too many um, girlfriends at the same time. And he said, my, my heart is a passel of scars. And it's like, <laughs> this guy had like a sixth grade education. And it's like, that's perfect. You know, it is. So it, it can stand in for a whole bunch of other words. It can stand in for a whole bunch of other, uh, a, a lot of meaning with great economy. Mm-hmm. And, and I also, with so you know what a shibboleth is? You know, if, mm-hmm. you, if, if basically in insiders, like there's a place two miles from here called Rocky River. And if you grew up there, 
and you said, oh, I grew up there, I grew up in Rocky, it would be absolutely certain that you did not grow up in Rocky River because no one ever calls it Rocky. They call it river. It's specifically what they call it. And by saying that, you would be giving yourself away as an outsider, you know, by, 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 by saying I, I grew up in Rocky because no one ever says that, you know. So there's it's along with this economy and everything like that. I also think that there's ways that that, that are built into um, our language that um, help us to feel like we're part of a group that is one of us. So there's a feeling of belonging, which is a very human need, right? When you say yeah. Louisville, when I say when you say Louisville, you're announcing something because you're not there when you say it. You're saying it in Houston, Texas, or Manhattan, or whatever. You're announcing to anyone else there that that that's your thing, and and they and that's like a little dog whistle took on a bad a, a bad connotation. But I mean, it's a way of a shorthand for someone else to say, you know, uh, I'm an insider to this, right? Yeah. Yeah, I love that. I love that. But, you know, um, when Holland and I started this question about what is a metaphor to describe dot, 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 um, some of our guests really experienced difficulty. And some of our guests just had a, you know, right off the tip of your tongue. Um, so I'm going to start with you first, Brian, and then we can ask everybody else, Grant and Martha, what's a tool or a tip that would help develop a descriptive language? Because you kind of talked about it a little bit, Brian. A tool or a tip that would help to de develop a descriptive language? Okay. Um, I, I think probably conversations and reading and just ha putting as much into your hard drive as you can, but also empathy, being able to see somebody else's point of view on something. You know, I mean, is the war of Northern aggression different than the Civil War? It's the same thing, really, right? But it's it, it's it's a different way of saying it, and it's also a way of suggesting another point of view, right? So I think being able to see someone else's point of view, um, reading, there's no substitute for that, unfortunately, for people who don't like to read, and talking, but more important, listening, right? I think those would all give you a, a bigger hard drive when it comes to that, right? I love that. I love that. What about you, Grant and Martha? Well, I, I love what Brian said um, about filling up your hard drive. That's another thing that Grant and I um, uh, recommend. Just read, 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 and read widely. Read your betters. Read, read the uh, things that you might not uh, stumble that you might not uh, stumble across in your own life. But uh, you know, reach beyond that um, to um, to other kinds of things, you know, books, books that you might not have ordinarily picked up. Um, I think that, that Brian's advice to, uh, to read widely is a really good one. And, and when I think about this question, um, it makes me think also about just some of the general advice that Grant and I give about writing. And I guess my one, my one suggestion would be to, um, to lean into your senses and try to be as specific as possible. Um, I like recommending taking an art class because I think if you if you take a drawing class, then you learn to observe things. You're like an ant crawling slowly, slowly over every single line of whatever is in front of you. And, uh, and I think that, that that kind of specificity can really spark your creativity. I'm thinking about uh, what the Russian writer Chekhov said about don't don't tell me the moon is shining. Show me the glint of light on broken glass. Oh. Um, so, you know, I, I would I would say uh, lean into your senses. Excellent. This is such a great tool. Grant, anything else? Uh, yeah, these are both good topics. I mean, these are both they've both given great suggestions with the senses. I suggest turning one of your senses off. Turn off the obvious mm. one. If um, if you feel like it's a visual thing that needs to be explained, try explaining it without the eyes. If it's something that you're hearing, try explaining it without the ears. See if you can do that. And it's a real challenge. And this comes from uh, an experience I had in, in college where I had a friend who had no sense of smell. And we used to 
I just it was a fun pastime where we would try to explain smells to her with other senses, uh, tactile senses or sight or other things. And I remember trying to describe the scent of new money to her. I described it as the feeling of clay between your fingers. And and Ooh. she said that was she said that was evocative for her. That that was something she would remember. And and I think it would work for many circumstances just to turn off the obvious sense. And see if mm. that works for you. Mm. So good. These are excellent. We'll have to put these on our on our show notes for future guests, Holland. <laughs> right. Well, speaking of guests, one thing we learned in our brain health episode was that creativity will help us keep our cognitive function much farther into old age than we might otherwise do. And wordplay is something that supports creativity. Um, so it's something that supports longevity and brain health and cognitive uh, reserve and resilience. What are some of the benefits you've personally seen from your work with words? Hmm. With wordplay specifically? Yes. Um, well, I, I mean, I, I enjoy doing rhymes. I actually... Um, in part to get over my public speaking phobia, I started taking improv classes. And now, although we haven't done this in a long, long time, um, I'm part of a musical improv group. And so um, you have to think on the spot and make up songs on the spot and rhyme things on the spot. And uh, the rhyming can be particularly um, challenging. But what I've learned, I mean, one of the great things about improv is, is that is that it's really low stakes. You know, you can go out there and make a fool out of yourself and it's and it's just fine because, you know, it's only improv. You're only on a stage. And and um, and what I find is that, you know, more than you think you do. You know, you can be standing there and, and trying to come up with a rhyme at the end of that line. And, and you just think I have nothing. And somehow something squeezes out of that toothpaste tube of your mind at the last second. Um, and uh, so I, I don't know if that really answers your question, but it's, it's making me think about um, what a good exercise uh, that is for me, just in terms of, in terms of confidence and just sort of relaxing and, and letting your subconscious sometimes flow and, and show you things that you didn't realize you knew. That's interesting. Yeah. Brian, what about you? The first, um, the first book that I ever wrote was called Jamaica sandwich. And it was a, um, uh, it was a rhyming book in which you, uh, it, there were geographical puns throughout it. Okay. And so I started with a list of things um, and thought to myself, what does, what else could this sound like? Like Jamaica sounds a little bit like the Jamaica when you put another word next to it. So context is what I learned a lot about, you know, um, you know, there be, there was a, a, a stanza in there that said, and Anna can fix anything. A pair of skates, a cup, if your pants rip Indonesia, just Havana, sew them up. And Paris <laughs> and Havana and Indonesia are all highlighted and you can find them on a map, right? So like I'm sounding like I'm mean, seeing Indonesia and I'm thinking to myself, what does that sound like? You know, and it sounds to me very much like Indonesia, but I had to bake other words around it in order to have a context so that other people would be hearing what was in my ear. So I had to think of an audience that didn't automatically think of, you know, have Anna. Like I had to introduce a character named Anna in order to do that. So there was a lot of like backfilling. So I think I went, one of my books, the early books was um, You Never Sausage Love. And, and sausage is like made in, out of sausages in the, in the cover. And all of the things are food puns and i went i went through a grocery store and i'm looking at things and i'm i'm writing them down and i'm seeing that they they may sound like other things they could be part of other sentences and things like that so like context probably played a big role for me and um like empathy in the sense that i had to um have an understanding for someone else's interpreting this set of syllables and kind of what would what would they be hearing? What would they be thinking of? 
for me, wordplay is just kind of woven into my regular daily life. I, I'm not one of those people who will rattle off puns uh, or, you know, retell old jokes or repeat other people's uh, one-liners or bon mots. But um, I think it's just made my writing a little more distinctive. My original wish of improving my writing, I think, has happened where I'm just more likely to recognize a clunky phrase or recognize a cliche or realize that I've been leaning too heavily on a, a verb or that something doesn't work. And sometimes I'll just leave it because it's a one-off email that doesn't matter very much. But I'll, sometimes if it's important, I'll go back and rework that sentence or, or repurpose that paragraph or cut it out or, or do something different. Wordplay makes that possible when you stop thinking about sentences as these these chiseled in stone items that you kind of have to laboriously put down, but it's just start thinking, start thinking of them as, as blocks, uh, Lego maybe, or just something, little pieces that you can tweak and tease and tune. And, and occasionally, I don't know if the rest of you do this, but occasionally I have my little, my little jokes in there or my little bits of wordplay where there's a, an etymology that maybe only Martha knows about and a <laughs> word that I'm using and, and, you know, maybe they get it, maybe they don't, but I'm sure as heck not going to point it out, you know, and I just, yeah, it's just for me, I just throw it out there and it's, it's, you know, it's in the world. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's great. Well, these are great benefits to, um, again, thinking about words and how we can create wonder and, and observe things. I appreciate these. So as we close this first um, part of our conversation, because we have lots more conversation with uh, Grant and Martha and Brian. Um, I'm going to start first with you, Martha. What is an essential element we need to know to understand the stories about the wonder of words? What's an essential element we need? Um, I love your use of the word wonder because um, I I think about that so much. I, I mean, I mean, I guess it's a cliche to say so, but language really is a miracle. Um, the fact that I can have a thought in my head and and move my mouth and force air through my vocal cords and make the you know articulate these things. I mean, it is really a wonder that I can get you to understand at least a portion of what I'm thinking or feeling. And so um, I, I think just the wonder of words itself is, is pretty fabulous. I think that we should be astonished every time we really look at language, the, the way that we talk. I mean, think about the word astonish, you know, it comes from, from uh, the Latin word that means to thunder. It's related to thunder. It, it has to do with stunning. You know, if you're astonished, you're stunned. And um, so where am I going with that? I, I guess, I guess just remembering this incredible, incredible gift we have of language and just, just there's so much to explore. Mm, that is so good. How about you, Brian? So um, I would say that I, you, you, can you repeat the question? Cause I, I don't want to get too far off base here. Cause I can, yeah. I can talk forever in another direction. No, um, it's just it's just boil this this down. What is the essential element? If you had to leave somebody with one nugget of what is the essential element of why we need to understand the stories about the wonder of words? Why we need to understand the stories of them? Well, just the wonder of words. Why why do we even have this amazing, you know, why did you write all your books? Oh, what is okay. the element behind it? So, um as as was just mentioned, you know, you, you have an idea in your mind and you want someone else to have the same idea in their mind and you, you know, force air out of your vocal cords and say whatever, right? If I want you to think of a blue basketball, all I have to say is blue basketball and all of you can picture what I'm picturing in my mind, which is so complicated. But really, I think for me, I just think of it as this... Um, almost like playground this you know this this when remember when you were young enough that you would jump into a puddle on your way home from school or whatever i think of words as something you can splash around in and i think of it as messy and i think of it like i'm not a purist at all like you'll hear people say like you know um that uh, a certain word, that's, that's not a word. Well, a word is going to become a word if everybody uses it that way. In 1920, if there was a poster that said, baseball tonight, both of them were hyphenated words, okay? 
and neither of them are hyphenated words now. Downtown Cleveland, in big letters, I mean two feet high, it says that this building was funded by its citizens and builded by its people. Well, builded was the right word in 1906 or whatever, right? So I see it as evolving. I see it as something that I don't feel any like ownership of necessarily. And I'm also not the grammar police of things. I love when little kids um, playfully make mistakes. I love when they're using words that maybe um, are a little unconventional in an unconventional way. Um, I think the the Beatles song "A Hard Day's Night" was written because they said Ringo was always saying stuff like that. You know, oh, well, that sure was a hard day's night. You know, what does that really mean? I don't know, but you know, it 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 it, it it's still it's sort of cool. So I think that it is something that I greet with awe all the time. It's something that I enjoy participating in. I tell kids that language is uh, not a spectator sport, you know, and it's it's something you can participate in. Um, when I when I was in second grade and I read an Ogden Nash poem, and it said that um, uh, about uh, it, it took a word and completely changed the pronunciation of it just to have it rhyme. I thought, okay, so I'm eight years old and I'm like kind of given permission to stretch and pull our language. It's not something that comes to us like a fine crystal vase and all I can do is break it if it's handed to me. It's more like silly putty or Play-Doh or clay. And it's something that I can participate in. So I think being part of that is just part of the human experience and a really cool one. I love that. Thank you. How about you, Grant? What is an essential element for us to understand the wonder of words? Brian has reminded me that when I was in school, in elementary school and middle school, there were a few occasions where I wasn't well understood, where I, I didn't get my point across. And none of them were serious. But for some reason, these are the things that I remember now when I can't sleep. Uh, some of the, you know, that your mind runs through these just these embarrassing moments. And I feel like those times helped me go towards what I do for a living now. They pushed me towards a writer's life. They pushed me towards a communication life. And one of the things that we really haven't talked about here is language as communication. And this is at the heart of this is better understanding each other. And it's what our radio show that Martha and I make away with words does. We, at the bottom of it, no matter how much goofing off we do, <laughs> no matter how, how much we uh, just toss around old etymologies or goof on new slang, it really is about getting people from different walks of life to understand each other. A lot of the stories I remember from my own life about being misunderstood were because I was a child without enough words, without the language, to explain to an adult what I was thinking and what I was feeling and what I wanted them to know. And I don't want other people to have that experience. And if I can teach you through, to have the language, to have the vocabulary, to have the know-how, and to make it fun, well, then I think that's a very good thing. If Even as an adult, if you can communicate better and let the people that you care about or that you need to work with understand you better, that's important. That's important work. Mm. These are fantastic essential elements. We've got a miracle, a playground, and a way to commute and under communication so that we can understand each other. Thank you all so much. Well, I think my favorite so far was words are like silly putty. <laughs> I never thought about it that way, but that's pretty awesome. Mm. Well, special thanks to Martha, Grant, and Brian. This is such a needed conversation. While you wait for part two, please go to the afterwordpodcast.com and become a subscriber. Leave us a review wherever you get your podcasts and tell your friends about us. And as always, you're welcome at our table. 